Hello, everyone. It's Reverend Yan, founder of Evolving Enneagram. If you've been seeking a compassion-based, contemplative approach to Enneagram inner work, you are in the right place. This is where contemplation meets the Enneagram. And so we are in week 36 of a 52-week Sunday talk series based on the book by Orrin J. Sofer, Your Heart Was Made for This. And we are now in the chapter on wonder. And today's talk is titled Point Five and the Wow Factor. So in this video, I'm going to share some reflections on point five on the Enneagram, how wonder relates to the contemplative life, and how you might cultivate wonder for yourself, for your world in these up coming weeks. So before I launch in, I want to say that I'm going to do my best to keep these talks shorter as we return from our summer break and begin our fall season of our contemplative practices and the Enneagram groups. So if you've been watching these on your own and you want a community in which to practice a contemplation that includes centering prayer practice once a week as they, we meet uh, together in group, and a place also to share your reflections, to, uh, to feel witnessed and held and seen and heard, as well as to see, witness, and listen to others across the circle of the Enneagram, across religious uh, divides. Uh, our folks, our members are from uh, different countries around the world and different religions around the world. So it's an interspiritual group. And so you are most welcome. Four groups launched the week of September 16th. That's in a week from now. And so this is your chance. We don't open the groups again until January. So this is your opportunity to uh, gather in contemplative Enneagram informed community uh, to deepen uh, your accountability and your uh, sense of connection and belonging while you engage uh, this work. So with that, let's begin. So I'd like to open with this true story. Uh, on May 5th, 2019, it Symphony Hall in Boston after the orchestra had just finished playing this particularly beautiful piece, a performance of Mozart's Masonic funeral music uh, by the Handel and Haydn Society, it was so quiet for a second after that concluded that you could hear a pin drop in the hall. And then in the audience, Someone did something very unusual. Somebody yelled, wow. And it was such a departure from the typical audience protocol that that wow resonated not only in the hall, but throughout the entire classical music community. Then David Sneed, who was the president of the Handel and Haydn Society, was just, his response was absolutely thrilled. And in an interview of him, he said, it was amazing. And these are his words. He said, there was also a sense of wonder in that wow. You can really hear it on the tape. So I got a recording of it to share with you right now. Take a moment. Imagine the orchestra has just finished playing. Wow. So David Sneed hunted down the voice by emailing everyone who attended that night and he found the concert goer, Stephen Matten, who was there with his grandson, whose name is Ronan. So 
Apparently, the audience there wasn't the only one surprised by the wow. Stephen was also, because his grandson Ronan is on the autism spectrum and is considered nonverbal. So he normally doesn't express himself, but that wow just came out. Since then, beautiful story, Ronan's family has built a relationship with the orchestra, going to a lot of like private events and such, just as this way that Ronan is able to connect. And how did I find out about this? I found out because this wow went viral and I actually saw it uh, just a couple weeks ago on Instagram. And I was I, I was actually thinking how, how moving it was and I watched it several times. So I remembered it when this topic of wonder came up, right? So it went viral and Ronan's wow then ended up being a wow that wowed the world, right? Yeah. So let's talk about this wow factor and Enneagram type as well as Enneagram point five. Remember that when I talk about point five, what I'm talking about is this the qualities that are present uh, in all of us, right? Type fives might um, over identify with the qualities that are at point five. But when the Enneagram is seen as a map of consciousness, point five is something that lives inside all of us. This said, let's begin with talking about the type five. Some of you already know, I kind of have a special place in my heart for type fives. There's just something about them. And I think that um, my theory is that I think a lot of fives act on the outside or in the world the way that I feel on the inside. You know, even though like especially nowadays, people who know me were like, oh, you know, I can speak in front of thousands of people and not, you know, feel shy or such. But I grew up so shy, excruciatingly shy. And I would in classrooms or even at church, you know, like when I started going to church, which was much later in life, I sat in the back of the room, right? I would always be the one like way in the corner sitting. Also, throughout my life, I read voraciously. I devoured all the books I could find in the public library because, you know, we were poor. And so I didn't have like access to buying books, but I read everything I could find in San Clemente Public Library. So I was quiet. I read. Um, and I think that also a lot of times I would, because I would quietly read. I would just know more than other people about a topic that they were talking about, but I wouldn't say anything, uh, at, sometimes out of fear of looking foolish or stupid, you know, which is very five-ish, right? So it's like the inside of me has always felt that energy. And, you know, obviously the threeness, it's like you would most people wouldn't even know. But so when I see a quiet guy in the corner, like there's something about that that's always um, pulled at my own heartstrings. It's like, it's a, it's a part of me. And so for me, the type, the energy of the five is often about like this wisdom that is hidden. At the low of five, I believe that fives go to this really dark place of disdain and despair over the world um, because they're convinced. They become convinced when they become more fixated. Uh, they become convinced that they know. They know what the world should be like, right? And they refuse to engage with this um, world that they feel has lost it, 
right? Like they know better, but others are foolish or ignorant or unwise. And so I think that's the low of five, what happens there in fixation. Um, and a part of it is the sense that fives, not all fives know right away, but fives are actually in the rejection triad, right? Fives are rejection types. And I have a belief that from this fear of rejection, or for some of you fives, an actual experience of of rejection, right? That then you just internalize and then go back out and reject the world that has rejected you, right? It's like pre-rejection, right? You defend against the pain of experiencing the emotional impact of feeling rejected by staying in your head about it and kind of kind of pushing back the world, like the world's over there and you're over here on your high horse, right? Like, so that's the low of five. But let me tell you about the high of five. For me, the high of five is truly wise because it approaches the world um, in a spirit of awe and wonder. Now, there's a distinction between the two, awe and wonder, but for the purposes of today, that distinction doesn't really matter that much. Just think of it as one, awe and wonder. So the five is curious and open, has beginner's mind, but not just toward like what you're researching, but toward people, because there's this humility of not being sure not being sure, being open to being schooled by life, being taught and, and learning, uh, having beginner's mind. So I think the high of five is not being sure and showing up anyway, not showing up as a know-it-all, right? That knows better than you, not being sure. So I remember when I was still in church ministry uh, doing Sunday talks on the Enneagram for the most part, and I showed a video and I wish I could find that video. I looked for it, um, but it's a video of like, you know how you pan out and you see like the wonders of the universe and you, know, you pan out from the earth and um, you pan in and you pan out. And so you could see microscopically like the plants and everything. I will continue to look for that video. Um, I remember in particular the fives who were in my community loved it, you know, and, and I, and I loved that they loved it because there was something so innocent and so like, look at us, you know, it's that image of this little person in this massive universe. We sit in reverence before it, right? Not as know-it-alls and not removed but us amidst this vastness of universe the wow that's wow right so the fives at the highest expression of fiveness for me embodies the wow factor so yes fives in particular have it when you're a type five you have this access to this, um, I would call it like an essence quality, but in a way, what I see is that wonder itself is an antidote to despair, right? That wonder arises from our essential nature, all of us, right? Um, and just like in that the Enneagram teaches us that we are not just one type, right? All of us have access to that spirit of wonder, right? That just gets to be expressed in particular through type fives, just like power is particularly expressed through the type and modeled through the type eight, right? And so, but we all have access to it if we're willing to open up and leave the habit of our type. Wonder interrupts the habit of type. Yeah, because in a moment, right, you and I, 
different um, perspectives and backgrounds, and, but we might sit down and gaze at the Northern Lights and suddenly, oh my gosh, like what we knew gets blown away in that moment. And there's this universality to our shared experience of wonder, right? Wonder is an antidote to despair and wonder interrupts the habit of type. So going back to Sofer's book, I wanna share um, some of his reflections on wonder. He writes, wonder opens the door to new experiences. It invites us to reclaim our body's deep knowing, integrating emotional and somatic intelligence with our mental knowledge. We sense how the vitality flowing through us, the energy that animates our body, heart, and mind connects us to all life. We remember in our bones that we are not separate from this world, but our nature made conscious and self-aware. Wow. I think in this moment, I'm hearing this quote anew as it relates even to that point five of feeling like an island and separate, but instead through the, the gift of wonder, recognizing that we are connected to all life. We remember in our bones, right? Not just in our heads, in our bones that we are not separate from this world, but our nature made conscious, right? So how do we tap in to this gift of wonder? To access wonder, of course, some of us experience it spontaneously, right? Uh, maybe um, at a birth or sometimes at, a at someone's deathbed. Um, we might experience it, I really want to go, I mean, I've seen the Northern Lights a few times because I lived in Alaska. I really want to see Niagara Falls. Right? So there's some special things I want to do. But for those of us who might not have the financial means or the time right now to go about and do some of these things, I want to say that everything we read and study about wonder tells us that wonder can be cultivated in everyday life simply through our attention, cultivating our attention uh, to be mindful, right? And again, uh, Orrin J. Sofer writes, to access wonder, find ways to be naturally mindful and curious. Pay complete attention. Like a child observing a butterfly for the first time. This requires humility. You must be willing to become fully absorbed in the present setting aside ideas about what you know and what will come. Intellectual analysis, comparison, and craving corrode wonder. They block your capacity for connecting with the raw experience of the moment, be it marveling at the morning lights, glinting off the tile, the aroma of a cup of hot coffee, the voice of an old friend or the hummingbird sipping from a summer flower. The Buddhist Jack Cornfield wrote in his book, A Lamp in the Darkness, that spiritual practice then. So for many of us on this journey, it gets super serious, right? Spiritual practice, I'm doing my practice, right? So he writes, spiritual practice should not be confused with grim duty. It is the laughter of the Dalai Lama and the wonder born with every child. Yeah. And I just quoted from a bunch of other books, but guess what? 
Uh, I have a big announcement. I can't believe I didn't tell you this already because I've been bursting with it. My book, The Enneagram of the Soul, is finally out and available for pre-order. So it's kind of not quite out, but you can order it now. And uh, there is actually a chapter in the book on the practice of cultivating awe, right? A-W-E. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, I think, you know, they're cousins, awe and wonder. And so I wrote in my book, when we pay attention, the simplest things can call to us. The way sunlight filters through the trees, the elegance of a hawk soaring in the sky, the changing faces of the moon, the way each flower opens, a special poem, or our cat's purr. Yeah. So awe and wonder have this active piece, right? We're cultivating it through practicing, paying close and slow attention. So there's that piece, but there's also the receptive piece that is a contemplative. We cultivate our capacity through contemplative practice, but receptivity itself is also a contemplative practice, right? So it's both. And so we dedicate attentive time and then our receptive being allows ourselves to be literally, wondrously awestruck. So remember that kid from my opening story, Ronan Matten. A poet named Todd Boss was so touched by what happened that he wrote a whole children's picture book based on that wow. The book is about a boy who is quiet, who is born into a noisy world, and who doesn't speak much, but when he does, it's a real wow moment. Now, this might be the story of some of you, especially if you identify as a five, right? It could be the story of your type in a way. But for all of us, we can think of the noisy world not as out there, but the noisy world of the habit of our type in here, in our own minds. The boy who is quiet is that still small voice of spirit. And contemplation is this practice of emptying, opening our awareness, being available paying attention and receiving that which can render us awestruck. I'll close with the words of one of my favorite poets, Mary Oliver. She wrote, instructions for living a life. Pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. Maybe you will tell us in the comments below or at an upcoming CPE group. Namaste. Wow.